Hello, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient times to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Ravi Somea, author of The Golden Thread, The Cold War, and The Mysterious Death of Dog Hammerskjold, published by 12, uh, July 2020. Thank you for speaking with me. Of course. Thank you for having me. So first, um, can you give me a little background on the subject matter and um, why you ended up writing, studying and writing a book on this subject? So on September 17th, uh, 1961, the second UN Secretary General, Dag Hammarfeld, who's Swedish, his name is very hard to pronounce, <laughs> uh, was flying across the Congo to sort of mediate a civil war there. He was trying to broker a peace. Uh, between uh, a very rich region of the Congo that had seceded uh, and the rest of the nation, uh, which had begun a civil war. Uh, and his plane crashed in very mysterious circumstances, and it's uh, always been disputed since then whether it was an accident uh, or whether he was killed by uh, a number of nefarious forces which were massing on the ground underneath him. Uh, the, the Congolese civil war. Uh, had become kind of a proxy war for the Cold War. So America was there, and Russia was there, and Britain was there. Uh, and it had also become kind of a um, a rallying point for global white supremacists who saw the end of Belgian rule in the Congo as, uh, uh, as something to be uh, avoided and, and fought against, uh, and who'd also poured into the nation. Uh, and they were all kind of united by the fact that they didn't much like Hammerfeld, who you know, in a sort of idealistic fashion, was hoping to reunite the nation and let the Congolese rule themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you get into studying and writing on this? So I, I'm, I'm a journalist, and I was working nights at the New York Times, and it, it sounds very glamorous, but it's very boring. <laughs> uh, you're kind of watching a police scanner, and, and, you know, crimes tend to come in clusters, and most of them aren't that interesting for a journalist. And so to fill the time as the sort of nights ticked by, I would just read weird, interesting stories. Um, and I came across a United Nations report about the death of Hamilton, and I was just totally enthralled uh, by him as a character. I mean, he's the quintessential thwarted idealist, the man who, who wanted to do good things and kind of walked into the propeller of, of more expedient, cynical forces. Uh, and I think we all have felt that way and, and feel that way some days. And just the cast of characters and the the depth of mystery uh, was incredibly compelling. and I couldn't stop reading, and, and that's my barometer for a story I'd like to tell. Mm -hmm. and, and what years did the did the war occur between? Um, so the Congolese were granted independence in the summer of 1960, and things started to go in a difficult fashion shortly after that. Katanga, the, the sort of wealthiest region that was sort of rich with copper and, and other important minerals, uh, seceded not long after that. Um, it's difficult to give a formal date for the beginning of the war, but you can kind of make an argument that since independence, almost until now, it's really not been at peace. Hmm. Okay. So then, there have, there have been a few books written on this this war. How um how does your book differ? What what approach does it take that's new and fresh? Well, I mean, there's lots of new and fresh information. There's wonderful investigators and investigations uh, that have been taking place in. in in very recent years, and so we're finding out more each year, uh, and we're adding new detail each year. I mean, what I wanted to do was just do the ultimate rip roaring uh, non fiction spy thriller. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was going for. I wanted to kind of tease out the motivations of each player. I wanted you to understand, you know, why a white supremacist might want to go to the Congo and fight, and what motivated Hamilton to do the right thing. And uh, I wanted to take readers to all these amazing places they couldn't couldn't go by themselves, and I, and I wanted to air some of this fantastic investigative work. I mean, one of the things that, that I and others helped, helped find is that, uh, you know, the ways in which American intelligence was in bed with a company called Crypto AG, for example, mm -hmm. um, which meant they could intercept all kinds of messages that, that we didn't think they could intercept, and uh, particularly the United Nations and a, and a, um, a jurist named Othman, who's running their investigation, found some really eyebrow-raising stuff, you know, thickets of spies and CIA shell operations and, uh, you know, secret memos flying back and forth. So uh, it was quite a journey. Mm -hmm. What was the, um, the, the UN was relatively 
kind of young at this point, I think. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the UN's role and what was going on? Yeah, I mean, the, we sort of forget now because the UN is sort of seen as a somewhat pointless footnote to everything that goes on, sort of a global bureaucracy that we don't quite understand. But it was founded, you know, right in the wake of World War II, and it was such a wonderful and idealistic notion that lay behind it. It was a notion of we've just seen the very worst parts of humanity given free reign. We don't want to do that again. We want to find a better way of, of running global affairs than shooting things at each other and attempting to wipe each other out. And Hamakov was its second secretary general. Its first was a, a Norwegian guy called uh, Trig Vilia. And, um, it, you know, it still retained some of the idealism of its founding. It hadn't been tainted by years of, of being seen as a, a debating shop. It was still seen very much as a force for good, as, as an institution that could help solve the world's problems or at least help guide nations towards their uh, better angels. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned that it, the province, it was Katanga, I think you said that the, yes. and that was, did they have, did they generate most of the income for the country at this point? And is that why their secession was so important? Yeah. So when the Congo was granted independence, uh, the Belgians who had been, you know, it's colonizers historically, but, but in that generation were just residents of the Congo. They were very scared. There was kind of a, um, a thirst for vengeance in the air among the black Congolese, you know, understandably, I guess. And so they all fled to Katanga, which is the southernmost region of the Congo and its wealthiest. By some estimates, it provides or provided a, a half of the Congo's revenues as, as a nation. Hmm. Uh, and then backed by the Belgian government tacitly and by mining companies, which had, of course, a lot at stake in that particular region, it seceded under a, uh, a president called Moise Shomba. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, it minted its own currency and printed its own stamps and said, we're our own nation. Uh, and of course, the motivation for Belgium and the motivation for the mining companies was the Katangese government was going to continue giving them great deals on the minerals they exported from Katanga and the Congolese government wanted more of a share for itself. Mm -hmm. Now, the, um, the, the white supremacists, I guess there were some from probably Rhodesia and South Africa. Um, I'm not sure what other countries might have gone there. Wh which part of the war, which side did they join and why? And so uh, actually they came from all over the world. Many of them came directly from uh, from Belgium. It became kind of a global rallying point. Uh, mm. And so Katanga, being the southernmost region of Congo, bordered a kind of a federation of nations called the Feder Federation of Rhodesia and the Arsalan, which, as you correctly point out, uh, is, of course, part of Rhodesia, or what became Rhodesia. And it sort of was seen as a bulwark for uh, white Africans. There was this sort of notion uh, among former colonialists that the black Africans couldn't rule themselves. They needed uh, Europeans or former Europeans to do the ruling for them. And it was dangerous to offer countries independence. Uh, and as you can imagine, this appealed to many of the white supremacists, uh, many of them former Nazis, who were knocking around around the world. And so when Katanga seceded and the central government said, we're going to send in troops to try and... Uh, bring this region back into the fold, Katanga sought to raise a mercenary army. And, and many of those mercenaries were white supremacists or, you know, overt Nazis. There were members of the SS and, you know, Iron Cross awardees um, among their numbers. Uh, and they sort of saw this fight as a fight for the soul of Africa, a fight for the soul of a, of a white Africa. Mm -hmm. And what was the Soviet and U.S. interest in this? Did they... Did they put any um, troops or, or advisors on the ground there? So the Congo was at the time the source for the world's richest uh, uranium. The, the uranium that was used in the Manhattan Project came from the Shinkalobwe mine in the Congo. Mm. Uh, so, of course, it was seen as a real strategic priority to maintain control over the Congo. It also borders, I think, nine other nations, so it's seen as key to the kind of key to a, a large region of Africa and, and control over that large region. It was also the world's uh, one of the world's top sources of cobalt, which is was necessary for the circuits in, in the missiles that America and Russia were pointing at each other. Mm. And, you know, the Cold War, like most wars, didn't make a lot of sense. So it just came to be seen that control of the Congo was strategically key. And so the CIA at the time sent in, you know, several operatives and it spent the most money it ever spent on any operation ever 
on maintaining control of the Congo. They were bribing officials, they were fermenting the correct sort of unrest, they were putting down the wrong sort of unrest. There's, you know, accusations they plotted along with Belgium to murder Patrice Lumumba, who was the uh, first democratically elected prime minister of the Congo and, and, and someone who, for various complicated political reasons, had kind of aligned himself with, with Russia. Uh, and of course, Russia was doing the same. It was sending in operatives. It was fermenting what it thought was the right sort of unrest. It was putting down what it thought, what thought was the wrong sort of unrest. And it was seeking to ensure that, that officials sympathetic to it were, were running the Congo. And of course, you know, while these two great superpowers fought what they thought was subtly, the, the Congo itself suffered. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking with Ravi Samaya, author of The Golden Thread. You can find more information about his work at ravisamaya.com. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep up with my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at fullcontactnerd.com and technologyinspace.com. Now back to the podcast. Now, one of the, um, I mean, one of the main reasons I asked to interview you about this book is that I've read previous books on this war and I'm, I'm just fascinated, like cynically fascinated by how much international subterfuge went into trying to control the freedom of, of these people who are trying to establish themselves in their own way, independent of colonial rule. So it's, it's kind of, it's a pretty sad story, but also, you know, something intensely violent and, and with all this cloak and dagger is also fascinating. So can you address that about the, the whole, the number of people involved or the number of organizations that seem to have their finger in this pie? Yeah, you know, it was absolutely astounding. It took me maybe a year of reading to even begin to grasp the the wheels within wheels and the and the webs within webs on the ground in in the Congo. Mm -hmm. um, it just was absolutely mad. And and the longer you looked at it, the more you discovered new operatives, new notions, new people who had an interest. So I mean, on a very basic level, you had the the CIA, which was running a very expensive operation to try and make sure that it had control of, of the Congo. It was working in concert with British intelligence, uh, SIS or, or MI6, if you prefer to call it that, which had a significant operation too. So they were kind of hand in glove with each other. But the British were working with British industry, which had a great deal of interest in, in Congolese mining companies. So they had kind of a, a dual interest. The Brits were also connected with the Rhodesians, who they oversaw indirectly, the Federation of Rhodesia and, and the Arsaland was overseen from the foreign ministry in Britain. So they also were supporting them. Uh, and they were supporting Katanga against the central government. Uh, you had the Russians who felt also that Congo was absolutely key. They wanted the uranium. They wanted the cobalt. Uh, the CIA was in cahoots with West Germany. Uh, and it went on and on and on this way. And, and you know, Hammerfeld himself was absolutely appalled by the quantity of, of proxy interests at work in the Congo. And, you know, one of the reasons he personally was involved in negotiating this conflict rather than, you know, handing it off to a subordinate was that he felt like it had the potential to erupt into, into World War Three, mm -hmm. uh, And he wasn't 100% wrong. How safe or how dangerous was it for, for the UN, uh, either officials or did they, I forget if they had any peacekeeping forces there. Um, how safe was they it? Did, they did, they had 20,000 or so peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. And what was it like for them? Well, I mean, so they came in and they thought of themselves as a sort of international gesture of goodwill. People, as you point out in the title, peacekeepers who were there to keep the peace and help reunite the nation. Of course, they absolutely weren't seen that way. They were seen as just another faction. And everyone hated them. The Katangese hated them because they felt like they were trying to let in the barbarian forces and, and, and ruin this bastion of white Africa. The uh, black Congolese hated them because they felt like it was another occupying force from the West. Uh, the CIA hated them. MI6 hated them. The Russians hated them. <laughs> they were not a popular bunch. And the peacekeeping force, what nationalities was it made up of? 
So Hammerfeld decided to uh, draw the peacekeepers from uh, smaller nations to avoid uh, exactly the thing that I just said, to avoid being seen as, as a prophecy for anyone. So they were drawn from uh, India and Morocco and, and Sweden and Canada, I believe, and, and, a, and a, a lot of smaller nations that, that were members of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the, another fascinating thing about this is the the number, the international aspect of this war, you know, the number of different, um, I mean, in one sense, if there wasn't a war going on, it'd be pretty fascinating to just go around and meet all these different people. But of course, they were all trying to kill each other. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were places you could do that. The Hotel Memling in, in Leopoldville, which is uh, the old name for what's now Kinshasa, seemed to me to be kind of a, a staging post for all these spies and diplomats and soldiers and United Nations officials and, you know, witch doctors who were visiting town. It was this crazy moment where you kind of had this rich tribal history of the Congo meeting a very technocratic sort of Cold War infrastructure, you know, meeting a war, meeting democracy. So you had all these worlds colliding. It, it always struck me that um, um, they think that HIV spread into the world from Leopoldville at around this time because it was just such a spot. Everyone came through there and ships were going in and out and planes were going in and out. It was just this kind of bustling spot of international intrigue. Now, um, how large were the forces involved in this civil war? Do you have, can you give uh, roundabout numbers? Uh, as far as I'm aware, the mercenary forces in Katanga... Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that the mercenary forces were also replete with and run by uh, French special, special forces soldiers who had uh, fought against the end of colonialism in Algeria. They were a particularly brutal bunch. Mm -hmm. They had trained in, uh, in what was then, I guess, Indochina and is now Vietnam. Uh, and they were absolutely renowned for their brutality. So they, they were running the Katangese mercenary, mercenary forces, which I think at their peak were around 12,000. Uh, and they were lining up against the Congolese uh, Force Publique, which is the sort of, or the Armée Nationale Congolaise, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was around 20,000. Um, and the UN had about 20,000 troops there. But that's without accounting for the spies and the secret air forces and and whatever else that was flying around. And the Federation of Rhodesia and the Arsalan had its own forces parked on the border. I'm not sure if you want to count those, but that was thousands more troops and a, and a whole air force. Do you know if were the, um, the, the arms that they were using, was it mostly like surplus left over from World War II, or were, was anyone supplying modern weaponry to, to anyone involved? So they weren't supposed to be supplied weaponry by anyone. They were under embargo, but of course, no one cared. So I know that the Russians were bringing in crates full of weapons, or at least that's what the CIA alleged. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the Federation of Rhodesia and the Arsalan was helping smuggle planes uh, to Katanga. Uh, and we know that it was a great grace and favor gift from America or, or Russia to any Congolese official you wanted to bribe, you give them a a helicopter or a, a plane or a collection of weapons and they're your friends for life. So I think it's hard to say, but there was certainly a lot of a lot more modern weaponry floating around than you think. Mm -hmm. And now, if I recall correctly, there were quite a, there were a few big massacres that happened on both sides. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it was so contentious to figure out that I, it's very hard to say with any specificity. There was claim and counterclaim of, of massacre and of mass killings. They're quite hard to verify because they're often disputed. Uh, but there was the siege of Shadowville, in which a contingent of Irish soldiers was held uh, hostage by Katangese forces. There was Operation Morthor, which was the UN operation to uh, shut down the secession of Katanga once and for all. It was a particularly bloody battle uh, in the streets of that city. There were allegations that a tribe that was loyal to the central government called the Baluba uh, was wandering around uh, Katanga with sharpened bicycle chains seeking mercenaries to, uh, you know, beat to death. And there were allegations upon allegation of, of brutality and atrocities by the white supremacist mercenaries who seemed to see anyone they walked past as fair game for a gunshot. Hmm. You know, something kind of uh, an aside, but the name Katanga was used in a James Bond movie, and it's just kind of, and since it came out around this time, I wonder if they used the name. Was this in the papers at all, this whole thing, or was it more of a kind of a 
invisible to the rest of the world, more or less. It was live and let die, wasn't it? Unless I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I did notice that actually that film was on at some point after I wrote the book, and I remember thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was. It was certainly publicized. It was certainly a conflict that was that was known about and and reported on. You can see very uh, in depth press clippings. David Halberstam, who I don't know if you've heard of, but is a mm -hmm. famous. Um, famous and wonderful journalist and, and non-fiction author was the New York Times correspondent in Katanga. So I got to draw on some of his wonderful, wonderful reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was certainly known about, but, but like so many of these things, it was forgotten. Mm -hmm. were, were there other African wars going on at the same time that might have, um, you know, taken people's attention as well? Yeah, I mean, this was a part of a wave of, of decolonializations in Africa at this time. I think between 1957 and you know, at the end of the 60s, there were dozens of nations which which said no more colonialism, thank you very much. And, and often those transitions weren't peaceful. The, the most famous, perhaps, was the French in, in Algeria, which turned into a really bloody and unpleasant kind of pseudo-terrorist war. I guess you, you describe it a little bit like um, the troubles in, in Northern Ireland, that same sort of uh, dynamic. And there was a, a, a terrorist organization made up of former uh, French soldiers in, in Algeria called the OAS, mm -hmm. uh, which went on a campaign to try and um, try and keep keep Algeria French. And actually, some of those soldiers ended up in Katanga. Mm -hmm. And again, and we've both kind of alluded to this, but one of the fascinating things about this time period and wars in this time period, like late 50s and into the 60s, is all the former World War II um, Axis uh, soldiers who, who, like you said, were had nothing to do. You know, at this point, they're sort of maybe in their 30s, 40s, 50s year old with skills that they um, that they can sell to, to people who don't care where they came from. Um, yeah, no, that's exactly true. And often they had served, you know, uh, two, three years in, in jail. It was kind of hard, I guess, to know what to do with some of these people mm -hmm. who had joined whatever organization and had maybe fought with the, with the Nazis and in this battle or that battle, but who ultimately needed to be reintegrated back into society. So they'd served two or three years and then they had nothing to do. You know, they were sort of racked with guilt. They were everyone's bad guys and they felt really sorry for themselves. And, and I sort of feel like every human wrong begins with self-pity. I think I'm stealing that from Marcus Aurelius, actually. Hmm. Um, and they decided they'd become mercenaries. So you had these forces for hire who were going around, you know, to fight for... Angolans against Portugal or for Portugal against Angolans or uh, for Katanga or for whoever would have them. And, and as you point out, people weren't super scrupulous. They had these skills, that, you know, most notably uh, many of the pilots who flew for Katanga. One of them was a really famous World War II fighter ace for the British RAF, actually, hmm. um, who was famous for, you know, being one of the most deadly pilots in the Battle of Britain, one of these deadly Spitfire pilots. Uh, and so it was really a, a strange and eclectic bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, I get the impression that it's around this period that the whole soldier of fortune uh, mindset or culture was developing. Maybe it had started earlier or maybe this is where it started. Do you, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a whole strange underworld of adverts placed in unexpected uh, newspapers of there was this uh, South African organization called the South African Institute for Maritime Research, mm -hmm. uh, which has a big part in the Hammerfeld uh, murder story. Um, and it was kind of a, an agency for mercenaries. Uh, and it was accused of all sorts of terrible and nefarious operations. It was trying to launch coups here and there. Uh, there was an accusation, it was trying to um, spread tainted vaccines and, and thereby spread uh, HIV and and AIDS as part of a coordinated campaign, although I don't know how true that is. Mm. Uh, but it was this whole mysterious and weird underworld, which was very interesting. How much did the UN think it could really accomplish in this war? Was it small enough, really, that they they thought they might make a difference? Or was it just trying to stem, stem the bleeding, so, you know, so to speak? Uh, I think that... So what drew me to Hammerfeld is he was an old-fashioned idealist. I think he was in some ways terribly naive. You know, he wasn't a perfect guy. He can be seen as this kind of Jesus figure, and he absolutely wasn't that. But he did want to do the right thing. He wanted the Congolese to rule themselves, and I think he felt like he had to try and, and that he had a fairly good shot of doing it. It was the case that he had decided 
uh, if he couldn't reunite the Congo, he was going to step down as Secretary General of the of the United Nations. So, of course, his limitations must have been in the front of his mind as um, on the last night of his life. Uh, and as it happened, it was a, a moot point because his plane went down and, and uh, he died. So, and I don't want you to reveal any of the interesting things necessarily that you came across, but did he feel like his life was in danger? Uh, like specifically, you know, apart from just working a war zone, did he feel like personally threatened or his staff personally threatened? There were lots of, the UN was absolutely despised in Katanga and it was, you know, pretty open contempt. There was, uh, the Katangese forces had the only jet fighter plane uh, in all of Katanga, which if you have the one jet fighter is of course a huge, huge advantage. <laughs> um, and that plane would, would go on strafing and bombing runs against you know, even high UN officials against Hamakwold's top deputy and Katanga got used to throwing himself into ditches and and checking whenever they went into someone's house that there wasn't a hostile force there. You know, there were mercenaries walking around saying they would solve the UN problem if you just gave them 20 kilos of plastic explosive. Uh, and just before his death, he had launched his operation, Operation Morthor, which was a very aggressive operation to take back Katanga for the central Congolese government, and in doing so, he'd upset everyone. Mm -hmm. The Brits were angry, the Americans were angry, the mercenaries were, of course, extremely angry. It was an extremely, extremely tense atmosphere. Uh, the way that I think about it was he was aware of the danger on his life. He had asked for his plane to have a fighter plane escort, uh, which Britain and America said no to. Uh, if they had said yes, it might be a very different position that we were in today. Uh, so he was aware of the danger, but what struck me in, in researching all this is that he still had no idea. He understood maybe the tip of the iceberg of the danger that he faced, maybe a third of it. The rest of it was unknown to him. Hmm. What argument was made that, um, you know, so so the country as a whole declared independence, you know, why couldn't someone argue, well, this province is allowed to declare independence as well, you know, if we're in this mood? That certainly was the argument that, that Katanga made, uh, but the... Congolese central government couldn't really function without the revenues from Katanga. It, it just was, it, it was not going to be a functional and viable nation. Uh, and I think maybe Hammerfeld felt, I'm conjecturing a little here, but maybe he felt that given that the secession was so overtly controlled from Belgium and, and by business interests, that it wasn't necessarily the same category of secession as, as that of the Congolese nation as a, uh, from Belgium in the first place. Hmm. What's your approach? In the writing of this book, how do you approach it? Is it chronological, and do you have it more, is it with facts, or is it more of a narrative, someone's story, you know, specific person's story? I mean, it's all of the above to some extent. I feel like we can't really understand. I mean, to me, what happened in history is almost pretty clear. To me, what's interesting is why it happened and what the people thought they were doing. Because mm -hmm. you can look at someone's actions and you can see what they did, but it's very interesting to me to see what they thought they were doing, because no one goes into it thinking, I'm a really bad guy and I'm going to do some evil. Mm -hmm. They always have some justification. They always have some thought, some notion, some utopia they're working towards. And so to me, what I wanted to do is, is, is like any plot, really, you, you bring together the motivations of all those characters and, and suddenly you get a sense of, of the ways in which all these people had little choice but to clash. You know, they wanted different things and they felt like each other were, were me a sort of, obstacles in the way. So I wanted to tell it, it's just like a ripping narrative. My favorite thing anyone can say about my book is that they couldn't put it down. So that's that's what I really wanted to do. And I wanted to, I mean, obviously we live in a world now that's pretty divided and the mechanisms of human division don't really change over time. They're always the same. And so looking around our world now, I could see some of the same tendencies. I think it's not difficult to to look around and see people who feel like they've been left behind and, and judged very harshly, who'd like to take their vengeance on on those who they feel wronged them, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure we can find any quantity of frustrated idealists, uh, and I'm sure we can find any quantity of cynical corporations who seek to profit from those dynamics. And so I guess I wanted to reflect a little of that too. Mm -hmm. What are some of the resources uh, you used for the research in this book? The, the clippings were, of course, as we discussed before, were fantastic. There were some fantastic journalists in the in the Congo. Uh, I mostly was incredibly privileged to be able to use the resource of the New York Public Library, uh, and 
you know, they brought me all sorts of obscure books and an unparalleled clippings database. Uh, I dug through archives in the Bodleian Library in, in Oxford, uh, and then just talking to people, uh, calling up people who were still alive, who were who were there. That's always the best resource. You know, you get a sense of how it smelled, how it tasted, how people felt. I mean, several of them said it felt not unlike Trump's America, which was a little scary. Hmm. Interesting. I'm speaking with Ravi Samaya, author of The Golden Thread. You can find more information about his work at ravisamaya.com. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep up with my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at fullcontactnerd.com and technologyinspace.com. Now back to the podcast. What, um, were you able to use any UN resources? Do they have a history? Yeah, the UN archive uh, is in, in Manhattan where I, I live, so I wandered over there on a few occasions. And uh, it's just a, a fabulous trove of, of treasures buried in various different places. There was one researcher uh, called Bo Virving who had gathered you know, this unparalleled collection of, of documents uh, contemporaneously. He was involved in the investigation of the crash. And so in a, in a box of instant macaroni and cheese, or a, a box that formerly contained instant macaroni and cheese in his, in his son's possession, was this amazing trove of, of really detailed and, and often very secret documents that couldn't be got hold of any other way. Hmm. Were you able to um, interview anyone who did any fighting during that period, or was it more the diplomats um, and the business people? Uh, it depends if you count spies as people who who fight because several of the, of the uh, intelligence operatives who were there were, were kind enough to talk to me. Uh, hmm. I won't reveal their names, but I guess, I guess it depends if you, if you count them as, as fighters or diplomats. So they could go either way. <laughs> That's a good point. So what part of the research did you find to be most enjoyable? It's a really tough question. I guess they're all enjoyable in different ways. You can be having a phone conversation with someone. I don't know if you find this too, but often you'll end the interview and you'll say thank you for your time and you'll be chatting a little bit afterwards and they'll casually mention something and it, it kind of brings a whole world together for you. It makes something make sense. Hmm. That's a, a real joy of that kind of research. And in an archive, you know, you'll always have wondered something and you'll turn over the 400th dusty piece of paper and suddenly it'll be there in front of you and you'll understand I mean, I guess the most exciting moments are always things which are which are new. So finding out some of the details about the involvement of West German intelligence, for example, was very exciting. Some of the specific... De I mean, at one point, there was a, a set of recordings that was declassified, or I had declassified, which was uh, two investigators into this crime, two former diplomats who were looking into it, discussing this really plausible confession they had received and just hearing their voices and hearing the excitement in their voices and hearing this story laid out on kind of crackly old tape really brought home the humanity of it so that was a particularly exciting one did you have a chance to visit any location associated with this work yeah i mean i was in uh in stockholm i was in uh, Uppsala, which is where hammerfold was born i was in oxford i was in london uh, I live in New York. I didn't get the chance to go to the Congo, sadly, because war and disease made it nearly impossible. Hmm. Uh, but it was a very international story. At the risk of, so I don't, again, I don't want any spoilers, but can you touch on what you might have found, what you found most surprising in your research? Or maybe if that's a spoiler, you can allude to it in a sense. Well, I can say that there's a point in the life of every mystery book where you think, I'm barking up the wrong tree. Maybe it was it's an accident, or we'll never know, and it will, and it's a pointless thing for me to write, and you have this sort of crisis. Uh, and about halfway through writing, I felt that way. And I can say that three quarters of the way through writing, I absolutely didn't feel that way. And by the end of it, I was absolutely persuaded that, that what had happened to Hammerfeld was, was no accident. Uh, but, you know, like much of life, what happened is much more complicated and much more interesting than we can conceive of sitting at our, our desks. Then uh, I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. 
was there any particular issue and again avoiding any spoilers any particular issue you were really trying to come to a conclusion on apart from your main idea um maybe a side question that you did find an answer to or maybe you still would really like to know some some aspect of it i mean there's the the key outstanding question for me is there were so many spies on the ground in in the congo and in katanga on the night of hammerfeld's death and if you apply to to have any of their findings which i can't imagine have any security uh, implications at this remove you know more than 60 years late 70 years later mm. um they just say we don't have anything those documents don't exist and on one occasion, one of those documents was accidentally paper clipped to a public document. So we know one of those reports is out there. Um, and that's what I desperately want to get hold of. We just, I would love to know what America knows. I'd love to know what Britain knows. I'd love to know what Belgium and Sweden know. I mean, one uh, very senior Swedish, Swedish government official told me that the reason Sweden doesn't reveal everything it knows is because some Swedish soldiers were cannibalized in the Congo. Uh, and they never told their families. They uh, told them they died of other causes because they found it too unseemly. And it would be too embarrassing now to go back to those families and say, I'm sorry, your, your son was, was cannibalized. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there are all these strange considerations. Uh, and there are all these sort of odd... I'm, I'm really not generally conspiratorially, conspiratorially minded because I feel like conspiracies are too hard, you know, People can't keep secrets, really. Not not in groups of more than one or two, anyway. <laughs> right. Um, and so I'm not really conspiratorially minded. But for example, on one occasion, uh, another researcher, not me, applied to the American government for anything it had on on Hammerfeld through a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. And spontaneously, around that time, the FBI destroyed all the documents it had pertaining to Hammerfeld. I just don't know why they would do that. I guess it might be completely random chance stranger things have happened but it seemed really odd to me uh and then you know there were several situations like that where another swedish researcher uh, a wonderful diplomat called ben uh he was asked by the swedish government itself to look into this and he spoke to the british government and he wanted to speak to an air traffic control mm -hmm. official who was uh, absolutely key in the events of that night um and the guy said sure I'll, I'll speak to you and then he called him back and said actually the british government said i can't and he never got hold of him again. And it's really, really strange. And I don't know why anyone would bother shutting this information down at, at this point. But yeah. it seems like people are, are keen to keep it secret. Hmm. How about uh, Russian documents? Was there any period like in the early 90s when stuff was open? I imagine it's not ac accessible now, but how about that? You know, I looked into that to some extent. There was some material from, uh, from Russia. There was a book by the British academic, whose name I forget, is it Christopher Andrew? Um, who uh, who had dug into those archives and it got some wonderful uh, stuff. Uh, and there was that book Spy Master by uh, the book by a former KGB operative who had been stationed at the United Nations, mm -hmm. uh, which had given some details on what he described as a, a misinformation campaign mm -hmm. to make it look like the CIA had, had killed Hamilton. There was some interesting information there, but as you point out, those archives are not readily accessible. I called uh, President Putin even returned my call, so I'm still waiting. <laughs> and you said that book was titled Spy Master? Yeah. And yeah, and you, awesome. you mentioned the South African um, Maritime Research Organization? Oh, which... like Kalugin was his name. Oh, okay. Okay. And and the um, and you also mentioned this, what was it, the mercenary organization South African Maritime research. The South African Institute of Maritime Research, yes. So there were all these weird documents connected with this one South African mercenary agency, kind of called the South African Institute of Maritime Research, mm -hmm. which, you know, in some sense, they they took credit for the death of Hamilton. It's a series of really weird letters uh, that seem to be between three operatives that seem to uh, run through the days until September 17th and 18th which seemed to imply this group had planted an explosive aboard Hammerfeld's plane um, and had been successful in an attempt to kill him, uh, which sounds completely ridiculous until you realize there were other, you know, peace-seeking officials who were brought down by South African mercenaries. Uh, there was a, a plane crash featuring an official called Samora Michelle, which is very mysterious in the same way the Hammerfeld one is. Um, and you realize that South African intelligence agencies 
they were very, very anti, of course, African independence movements. And so all these things take on a sort of dreadful veneer of plausibility, however ridiculous they sound. Hmm. You know, hmm. the South African intel before the end of our apartheid, so it seems like they are involved in a lot of sketchy things, and I imagine some of them are still around, you know, old and retired, but still they know a lot of things, I, I would imagine. Yeah, no, that's certainly one, one line of inquiry. It's not just me. There are other uh, Hammerfeld aficionados who are digging into uh, South Africa and, and digging into various archives to find bits of information. One of the most promising leads that's still going is the, the government of Zimbabwe, uh, which inherited some of the documents that the Rhodesian government did not burn uh, or dispose of, is, is digging through its archives. And there's a pretty high chance that... Um, there's already some stuff in my book that comes from that archive, which was absolutely eyebrow raising, and there's a chance of, of more interesting stuff from there. Uh, and that seems like a very plausible source of new information because the Rhodesians were sharing information with the British. Uh, and of course, the, the end of Rhodesia and the start of Zimbabwe was very chaotic, and it's very plausible to me that this document or that letter uh, snuck through their efforts to destroy it. Um, who else? Internationally, who else was um, working with the Soviet Union uh, on their side? So there were uh, regions of the Congo that were aligned with uh, with Soviet forces, uh, the city of Stanleyville, um, Lumumba, the, the democratically elected prime minister of the Congo. I don't think he was in any sense ideologically communist, but he wanted help, and the CIA didn't like him much, so they weren't offering that help, so he turned to the Soviet Union too, which made a pretty fateful decision in his life and uh, and death. But the actually a lot of the agents who were in the uh, Congo were Czech. The Czech Republic was I don't know if it's Czech, but I guess it was Czechoslovakia then was um was was in cahoots with uh, with the Russians and and its agents came from there mostly. Hmm. So was there a oh does the book does it go up to his death, Dog's death, or does it go, how far beyond his death does it go and look into what happened? It comes right up to the present day. So his death occurred on September 17th, 1961. Uh, and what I did was just look at each successive investigation and investigator in the, in the time since. And it, there are kind of these long arcs of investigation. Some people made it the work of their lifetime. Uh, a friend of Hammerfeld, a diplomat, and UN operative called George Ivan Smith, and... A French diplomat and, you know, uh, France's envoy to the United Nations and uh, advisor to the Monegasque royal family called Claude de Camilleria, um, a, a pilot named Beau Virving, a, a British academic named Susan Williams, uh, Mohammed Chand Offman of the United Nations. We follow each of their successful investigations uh, and each uncovered new and fascinating things. Does he have any family or friends alive who have a personal interest in getting an answer? Yes. Uh, so his nephew was the main, uh, Knut was the main uh, sort of familial point of contact. He passed away uh, recently. Hmm. But I was in contact with his, uh, with his niece. Uh, it's not like immediate family. He never married. Well, he had no children of his own. Hmm. And so, yes, there are members of his family around. Was there anything that you came across um, that, that emotionally moved you in some way, either positively or negatively? Yeah, you know, at a certain point, it started to get me down a little bit, this story, because um, the bad guys, in some sense, won. The Congo wasn't really reunited in, in the way that Hamilton would have wanted it to, and this wonderful idealistic figure, whether by accident or something more nefarious, I think the latter, is no longer with us. It kind of felt like the forces of darkness prevailed. But then I realized that Hammerfeld had this wonderful ethos. He had this wonderful way of looking at the world. He had this wonderful idealism. Uh, and it kind of lived on in the people who investigated his death. Uh, and I was really moved on, on going to see his grave in, in Uppsala. Uh, Hammerfeld's father was also a prime minister of Sweden. And he was a very stern and kind of warlike figure. Uh, and no one really goes to visit his grave, which is a giant 10-foot monolith. But Dark Hammerfeld's grave is right next door. It's a little quiet stone laid into the ground. And people do go visit that. And it, and they go and stand and, and they think and they contemplate this, you know, this man who was broadly speaking a force for good on earth. And, and it struck me that that ethos, that good, that 
that desire for honesty, that desire for peace, it, it endures even when we don't think it will. What was, um, he, I guess he grew up during uh, World War II. Do you know anything about what his life was during those years? He was an official in the Swedish government during World War II, but uh, as you may know, Sweden uh, attempted to maintain a form of deeply imperfect neutrality during that uh, during those conflicts. His father actually instituted that policy of neutrality, so the Hammerfeld name was not super popular. Uh, when he went to Britain, he would, to, uh, in his capacity as a Swedish government official, he was treated very much as an appeaser of, of Hitler, which I think must have had an effect on him. Hmm, yeah. What do you hope the book will do? I mean, firstly, I hope it will give people six or eight hours of just relief, of joy, of, of an escape from whatever they're seeking to escape. Mm -hmm. um, I hope they'll see echoes of our of our modern world. I hope they'll they'll click on the news and, and see someone angry about something and, and be able to look at a layer or two deeper. I, I hope it will give them some sense of, of the Congo as a, as a nation. One of the things I realized in writing this book is that Congolese history is so rich with, you know, with empires, with dynasties, with conquest, with rise, with fall. It's as rich as any European nation. And we just don't look at African nations that way. And, and I would hope that people reading this book who get a sense of, of a nation that they might just see in the odd headline as, you know, chaos and conflict as being a magnificent, interesting place. One of the things I discovered, for example, is that, um, the Congolese had a form of, of Morse code before Morse invented it. You know, they had all these wonderful means of of communicating and of, of organizing societies, you know, it, which grew up in parallel with the European societies we're familiar with. So, hmm. uh, yeah, I guess I hope they get a sense of place. Yeah, and um, the country is really, it's a huge country. You know, um, I guess some people might not think about how, how big it is, even looking at a map. I think the distances are just incredible like between areas. Yes, absolutely colossal. I'm going to mess this up, but it's either the size of the United States, east of the Mississippi or west of the Mississippi. Either way, it's very large. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, the same size as a big chunk of Western Europe. The, the, the distance is absolutely vast. Mm -hmm. And what was the population at this time? Do you know? I think it was about 20 million, uh, but I'm not 100%. I'm maybe yeah, between 15 and 20 million. Mm-hmm. So a huge country that, in a sense, was sparsely populated, except maybe in the urban centers. Yeah, I mean, Leopoldville was a few hundred thousand, and then you had these million, you know, 10, 15 million people spread out over just an enormous distance. I mean, you cannot make an argument that the Congo has never really submitted to being governed in, in the Western sense of the world. It's just absolutely vast. Mm -hmm. And covered with forests mostly, right, except maybe the mountain areas where the mining was going on? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, certainly it's most famous for its uh, its rainforest, uh, which covers a, a huge quantity of uh, ground and is one of the richest ecosystems on Earth. Everything seems to be alive there. Mm -hmm. One of the facts that I discovered is if you have a house in, in certain regions of the Congo, you have to scrape your yard to dirt. Otherwise, things just wind their way towards your home 24 hours a day that you would rather not have in your home. <laughs> Um, yes, it's a living environment without a doubt. Exactly. Did you have any difficulty, apart from your research, did you have any difficulties getting the book finished or published? I mean, it's always difficult to finish a book because I think it's, I mean, it's such a sprawling story. It goes over decades. Uh, there are, I don't know, I think 30 odd characters in it. Uh, and there were certainly points where I felt like I was going mad. I was tearing my hair out. There were too many people doing too many things to too many other people on too many occasions in too many places. And there's a point at which you is, you know, on the verge of madness or, or, or at least the very limit of what a human mind can, can contain. But, but somehow these things get, they get done, you know, they figure themselves out. Uh, and so I guess it impelled me to finish it as much as I finished it. Mm-hmm. Uh, which you, do you have a current writing project that you're working on? Yeah, you know, I'm always looking into uh, into other stories. I think they'll they'll continue to be international stories. Um, I like a story that that we think we know, but we don't really know. Uh, and I like a story with um, with interesting characters in it mm -hmm. uh, that takes place in in other nations. So I'm digging into a few of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, where can people find um, find you on the web? Do you have social media or website? Yeah, my name is Ravi Samaya, and that's my Twitter handle. My website is ravisamaya.com. 
Uh, my publisher is 12. Uh, and there's this service called Google, which I understand help, can help you find details about people. And uh, I'll spell your name for listeners. It's R-A-V-I, and then the last name S-O-M-A-I-Y-A. -A. There it is. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Uh, just to say thank you for having me and, and thank you for being interested. I uh, I really found this to be such a like immersive and oddly current mystery, and I, I welcome the chance to talk about it. Yeah, it's a fascinating subject, and I'd encourage anyone uh, to read to read your book on this. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep track of my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. Thanks for listening.